So I'm calling it Reese's Rumblings. <laughs> and at the top of that list is a earthquake that occurred uh, last July 6th up near Lincoln, Montana. It turns out that it was the largest earthquake in the lower 48 states during the calendar year 2017. At a magnitude of 5.8, and uh, it was widely felt throughout the region. This map on the left shows um, by zip code area um, areas that reported feeling this earthquake. There's um, almost 16,000 reports that came in for this event. The map on the right shows the same information but broken down by geolocation, so it's um, closer to where the actual person was that reported it. It was spelled all the way up from Edmonton at the top, to the north, to uh, Salt Lake City on the south, uh, Vancouver, Seattle, Portland on the west, and there's one report that came in from the Black Hills over in South Dakota. So this is a widely felt earthquake. Um, it was in the epicentral region, there was fairly strong shaking and there was some ground cracking that resulted from shaking, and in this case, of, of road fill material. Uh, these are not tectonic uh, related fractures, they're, they're the result of strong shaking on a hill slope with uh, weak soils, but uh, certainly some effects, some local effects from that. There was some um, objects came out in store shelves within a radius of about 60 miles. Uh, this is the Walmart in Helena. Um, I guess an appropriate title caption would be a cleanup on aisle five. <laughs> there were objects that came off the, uh, uh, some of the store shelves here in Butte as well, but I don't think it was quite that extensive. Um, we had some minor damage here in Butte. Uh, this is the Nathan Hotel. And up here at the top is a decorative piece that was composed of uh, granite blocks and bricks. Um, those objects that were knocked loose fell four stories onto the street down here. Now, very fortunately, this earthquake occurred at 12.30 in the morning uh, when the streets were empty. This picture was taken uh, two days later during the Montana Folk Festival. And as you can see, if the streets would have been crowded at that hour, um, there was certainly the possibility for injuries or, or worse. Um, as it were, there were no reported injuries for this earthquake that I'm aware of. We had some damage in, in the earthquake studies office. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, some of the file drawers opened up, um, which have the little thumb lock. I'm not quite sure how that worked. But we were able to repair this damage without excessive cost. <laughs> Mike, we suffered similar damage here at the archives. <laughs> some of our signs fell over. <laughs> so this earthquake occurred in the middle of the Intermountain Seismic Belt. These black circles are earthquake epicenters that have been located with uh, data from the Montana Regional Seismic Network since 1982. There's something like 46,000 earthquakes on this map. And as you can see, they form a dense belt that runs uh, up from northwestern Montana down towards Helena and then down towards Yellowstone Park, <coughs> where it apparently splits into two branches. One branch extends to the west uh, through extreme southwest Montana into central Idaho, and the other branch continues southward along the Idaho-Wyoming border and all the way to um, the Wasatch uh, down in Utah and, and then onward down to um, Nevada, southern Nevada. This is known as the Intermountain Seismic Belt. The majority of earthquakes that we get in western Montana occur along this belt. Um, also shown here are in, as uh, orange triangles are the seismic stations that we record in real time. Uh, the Montana network con consists of about 43 stations in western Montana. In addition to those, we receive signals in real time from Yellowstone Park, the Teton uh, network down near Jackson, uh, Wyoming, uh, Idaho National Lab, 
a couple stations up in Canada and, and eastern Washington. So in all, we're recording about 90 seismic stations around the region that we use to uh, locate earthquake epicenters and determine magnitudes. Also shown on this map are, uh, as red lines, are what are known as quaternary faults. That's a, a simply a name uh, for a fault that is geologically young. Uh, geological time is a little different than human time scales. Um, we consider faults young if they've produced a, a major earthquake in the last 2.6 million years. <laughs> <laughs> so um, these, these faults are, are, are the, the red faults are the ones that we know of or suspect could cause a future earthquake. If it's had an earthquake in the recent geologic past, it's more likely to produce an earthquake in the future. The green lines are much older faults. Um, they belong to a big fault system that runs from the Helena area clear over to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, called the Lewis and Clark Zone. These faults have existed since at least 50 million years ago, and likely before that. And what's curious about the, the, the star is the uh, Lincoln earthquake. Um, there are no young, uh, recognized young geologic faults near the epicenter of that earthquake. There are some to the east over by Helena and to the west up towards Seeley Lake. Um, but there are these other faults. And um, we're, some of us are suspicious that, that some of those faults might not be as old and ancient as, or as, that they may have some younger activity along them. Mike, can you show yes. where Butte is on that last picture? Butte is right here. So here's the, the epicenter of last summer's earthquake on a, a seismic hazard map. Seismic hazard map takes into account historic earthquake activity as well as what we know about these quaternary faults. Combines all that information and um, makes a map that shows the strength of shaking that has a certain probability of occurring in a 50 year window. Warm colors are um, more likely to be shaken by an earthquake. And so we can see this intermountain seismic belt running through the western part of the state. And that this earthquake here uh, occurred in this uh, kind of a saddle, a lower, relatively lower zone of uh, seismic hazard along this, um, along this intermountain seismic belt. And I should point out that this map changes as new information uh, comes, comes out. So this is a, a 24 hour seismogram, a record of seismic ground motion um, on the night of the earthquake, the day of the earthquake. Um, all of these lines are just like lines of text on a book. They start at the top, they go left to right across the page when you get to the end, you come back over here, go down one line and move across. Each line is a half an hour of, in length. Um, the earthquake starts up here right about there, and the shaking from the main shock lasted the better part of a half an hour, but large aftershocks started coming in immediately. About five minutes after the main shock, the biggest aftershock was a magnitude five earthquake that was felt by many people in the region. And all of these little tiny blips on the record are individual earthquakes. Uh, here's the, the same station um, two days later, showing the activity has slowed down considerably, but there are still literally hundreds of small aftershocks punctuated by, by larger earthquakes. So this is a very active um, aftershock sequence, as we would expect for uh, an earthquake, the main shock of 95.8. So here's a map of the activity um, as we currently understand it. Here's the town of Lincoln right here. This is Highway 200 coming from the Missoula direction and heading off towards Great Falls. Uh, Helena would be down over here just off the lower right corner mm -hmm. of the map. The purple triangles are our closest permanent seismic stations. This earthquake actually occurred within our network, but to really get accurate locations, you need um, stations that are, that are closer to the epicenters. And about two days after the earthquake, the U.S. Geological Survey deployed a, um, a crew and established three seismic stations shown as green triangles, one here near the epicenters, one at the Forest Service office in Lincoln, 
and one over here just outside of Helmville. Um, those data, those stations were uh, connected through a cell phone modem to the internet, and we were able to bring that data into our network in real time. And they uh, really helped um, improve our st uh, the locations of our earthquakes. Um, and then in August, um, the University of Montana uh, cooperated with them to put out three additional stations, shown in blue here, um, that, that provided some additional coverage of the aftershock activity. Unfortunately, those stations are not real time. That is, they record data at the location, and then somebody has to go out there um, afterwards, collect the data, and then we have to go back and, and reanalyze it. But when we get done looking at all that data, uh, we should have some very precise locations for these earthquakes. The main shock here is shown as the purple dot, and then in smaller circles and other colors are the are these smaller earthquakes, the aftershocks. You notice that most of them form this kind of north-south band about uh, seven kilometers or what's that, a uh, couple miles, three miles uh, long. And, but there is considerable activity that extends up to the northwest and down to the southeast. These black fault lines are some of those Lewis and Clark faults, the ones that as far as we understand, are not active. Um, so this earthquake occurred near one of these faults, but the band of seismicity, which probably indicates the fault is like north-south, is at odds with the mapped trace of that surface. <coughs> I should mention that these earthquakes are occurring anywhere between um, about, uh, let's see, well, they're, they're occurring from 10 to 14 kilometers below the surface of the Earth. Um, six, six to eight miles deep. That's how that they're occurring down in the crust of the Earth. And this little beach ball is what's called a focal mechanism. It describes um, two possible fault planes, one running north-south, one running northwest-southeast, and the sense, the kind of slip that might have occurred along whichever of those planes represents the fault plane. In this case, um, this tells us that this earthquake occurred along a strike-slip fault, that is, one side moving horizontally past the other. Uh, no up and down movement, just horizontal movement along a vertical fracture. And it appears that this north-south nodal plane represents the fault plane of depth. So this comes as a surprise. All big faults go north northwest. We have a nodal plane trending northwest, but the aftershocks argue that it was actually the other fault that occurred. So something, something interesting is going on there. Um, this is one of the seismometers that we deployed with the University of Montana folks. Um, we dug down the bedrock, set it up, leveled it, oriented it so that uh, um, it, ha it has a vertical sensor and two horizontal sensors. So once it's oriented, it'll measure up, down, north, south, and east, west motion of the ground simultaneously. Uh, it's connected to a data logger that uh, is housed in this case. We have a solar panel for powering the system. Um, this is Dr. Hillary Martins of the University of Montana and two of her graduate students, uh, Ellen and Andrew, who were uh, working on a project to, to work with this data. And this is just a comparison of the fault plane solution, the focal mechanism that we determined using the first motion of P waves from our network and that that the U.S. Geological Survey came up with a full body wave inversion. And you notice that the lines look very similar. It's a, um, a confirmation that our, that our focal mechanism um, interpretation is, is probably good. So here's just a couple maps showing earthquakes in this area um, in the first half of 2017. Um, there are, what, 2,300 earthquakes in along the northern end of the Intermountain Seismic Belt in the Centennial Tectonic Zone. Uh, quite a bit going on at Yellowstone. I'll speak to that in a moment. And then after, uh, starting the day of the main shock and continuing through the end of, uh, of 2017, there were over 3,300 earthquakes, and this big cluster here represents a, a, the vast majority of those. 
And here's just a closer, a zoomed in view of that same data. Um, there are scattered events in, in this part of Montana before the earthquake. It's been uh, seismically active ever since we've started monitoring this region. Uh, commonly, little magnitude one and two events, uh, groups or clusters. There was one event here, a uh, magnitude 2.3. It occurred 23 hours before the main shock and was located very close to where the, the main shock occurred the next day and, and is rightfully classified as a foreshock. Um, most Montana earthquakes don't have foreshocks that we know of. This one had one very small foreshock that nobody would have been, it would have been much too small to feel. And then here's the same area for the six months uh, following that, and you can see that big blast of seismicity here and the activity extending out on both sides. So uh, we're still getting aftershocks. We're getting one to two small events per day. Um, we have not gone for a 24 hour period yet um, without having at least one minor aftershock. So it's, uh, it's, it's winding down, but it's still in progress. So switching gears now down to uh, Yellowstone, um, there was an earthquake swarm that began on um, June 12th of this past summer. Um, it, was, it was moderately active, and then on June 16th, there was a magnitude 4.4 earthquake that kicked off a tremendous uh, swarm of earthquakes. Um, there were thousands of earthquakes, and they were concentrated in this area up just north of West Yellowstone, uh, right on the very edge of Yellowstone Park. Actually, some of them spilled over into Montana, and <coughs> they, they just formed this big um, splotch of activity. Um, here's a, here's a, a similar view just showing activity in the surrounding area. This is the, uh, what they're calling the Maple Creek Earthquake Swarm. You can see there's some scattered activity around Hebgen Lake and going back towards Montana and other small clusters within the park, but this is really the big player. Um, over 2,800 earthquakes in this swarm. And this, I know this is hard to envision, but these are, this is kind of an oblique, if you could slice open the earth and look at it at an angle. This arrow points north, and you can see that the colors represent uh, from oldest in blue to youngest in red, the occurrence of earthquakes. Um, so you can see there's a, the activity started out over here and then appears to have spread off in this direction. Viewed from another angle, you can see there are little uh, stringers of activity that really suggest that these earthquakes are occurring along individual fractures. And um, this is work that was done by David Shelley of the U.S. Geological Survey where they go in and do very precise um, analysis of the relative locations get, get so they can, even on these very tiny earthquakes, can tell within probably a few tens of feet um, how they occurred relative to each other. And this is a movie that they published for an earlier swarm. In 2010, it was a swarm down south of West Yellowstone. Unfortunately, we can't play it here, but you can still see the the general picture. Here's a map view. All those white dots are earthquakes. Um, I forget how many. There were eight or 10,000 earthquakes they located in this swarm. And if you drew a line between A and A prime, sliced the earth open, and looked at it sideways, you would see that most of that activity is occurring along this dipping zone. There are other little lineations that occur in there. And um, what, what you see when the activity runs up and down, and you'll see it start here and migrate up or start over here and go down. And the current understanding of, of these earthquake swarms um, is that they are related to the escape of uh, hydrothermal fluids um, through fractures in the Earth's crust. It's not, I should have mentioned back here, that um, these earthquakes are not occurring in the, um, the, the oh, I know which, this, this slide right here, this, this outline is the outline of the, um, the Yellowstone caldera, the, the mouth of the volcano that underlies Yellowstone. 
And the earth, earthquakes are occurring well outside of that. Even these other ones close to West Yellowstone are still outside the caldera. And so we believe that these, uh, earthquakes, or these earthquake swarms are related to um, mainly water, but there could be some gases and, and other fluids that escape out of, and they, they're, they're coming out of the, um, the underlying volcanic system and basically migrating outward through cracks and as they do so, they temporarily, temporarily lubricate those faults, <coughs> allowing them to slip. And that's perhaps why you get a whole bunch of little earthquakes instead of one big one. Um, in February of this year, there was, after quite a whole hiatus in activity, there was another uh, outburst of activity. It's kind of right on the east end of the Maple Creek Swarm. And it's more tightly contained. The, the, the other Maple Creek swarm kind of filled in this area. It included some activity in this area, but this is more concentrated. It only had 913 earthquakes in it. <laughs> um, and I forgot to mention here, um, so I, the, the largest earthquake in this swarm was a magnitude 4.4. There was one earthquake over magnitude 4, 12 earthquakes in the magnitude 3 to 3.6 range. For comparison, this latest um, activity had only three earthquakes in the magnitude three range, low magnitude three range. Um, back in 1985, was what was called the Autumn Swarm. It occurred in the West Yellowstone area. Back when our seismic monitoring capabilities were much more primitive than they are currently, and only the larger earthquakes are reported. And and uh, they're not as accurately located because the seismic networks have evolved significantly since this, this date. But if you tabulate the number of earthquakes, the biggest earthquake was a 4.8. There were nine earthquakes in the magnitude 4 range and 73 in the magnitude 3 range. Well, these earthquakes were all being felt at West Yellowstone. I mean, West Yellowstone's right there. They were sitting basically on top of this. And, um, it was cre creating quite a bit of um, consternation amongst the local residents who were literally feeling hundreds of earthquakes. And it ran its course and there was no cataclysmic eruption. So <laughs> next time somebody tells you that because Yellowstone is swarming, there's going to be an eruption, I tend not to believe it. <laughs> and then I'll just briefly mention um, in September 2nd of this year, down near Soda Springs, Idaho, there's Pocatello, I-15 headed north to Butte and headed south to Salt Lake City, was a magnitude 5.3 earthquake that had a, a very active aftershock sequence. The biggest aftershock was a magnitude 5. It had 30 <coughs> earthquakes in the magnitude 4 range and 182 in the magnitude 3 range. So even though this magnitude-wise was a smaller earthquake, it had a much more um, uh, vigorous aftershock sequence, um, and it may be the type of faulting that's involved, or that's one of the things we don't really understand is why there's so much variability in these uh, aftershock sequences. So now I'd like to switch gears completely and talk for just a few minutes about the Bitterroot Fault over uh, in western Montana, south of Missoula, down in the Hamilton area. This is a view of the Bitterroot Mountain Range looking off to the northwest. You notice these big sloping surfaces here. And this is actually the, the surface of what's called a low angle detachment fault. It's a, it's a, it's a dipping surface and the, the side we're standing on some 50 million years ago gradually slid down that slope and the mountains raised up out of the ground in the Bitterroot Valley form. Well, this is a type of um, fault that is fairly unusual, uh, being a low angle. Most, most normal faults, the normal fault is one where the mountainside goes up, the valley side goes down. Most normal faults are very steep. 60, 70, 80 degrees is not uncommon. This one's about 20 to 25 degrees. So it's, a, it's an odd duck. It formed a long time ago, and as far as we knew, there wasn't any detailed inf information to suggest that it might still be active. Well, um, the, the Valley County got some uh, money from FEMA 
Oh, before I get there, let me just point out where, it, so here's the Bitterroot Fault in western Montana. On our seismic hazard map, the green areas are areas of relatively low seismic, seismic hazard. And you'll notice there's only a handful of black dots, epicenters there. It's in a, it's in a quiet part of the state, so um, why would we expect this fault to be active? Well, here's a, a uh, Google Earth view looking down at the mouth of Big Creek, coming out of the mountains here and flowing out uh, towards the Bitterroot River. This is the Curlew Mine. So this is, a, this is what you would see from a, a satellite view or an aerial photograph. But, but LIDAR data paints a whole different uh, picture of the landscape. Um, in a nutshell, uh, airplane flies over shoots millions of laser pulses down at the ground and measures how long it takes them to travel back to the plane. And um, from that calculates a map of the surface of the Earth, a very detailed uh, topographic map, if you will, a digital elevation model. And you, you can digitally strip off the vegetation from this type of data and just leave what they call the bare Earth image. And I guess this is, might be what you would see it, it, after the apocalyptic forest fire when every single thing is burned <laughs> down to mineral soil. Um, so here's the mine. This is the Curlew Mine. It's been reclaimed. Uh, this pile over here has something to do with the mine. Here's Big Creek flowing out of the mountains and headed down towards, towards the Bitterroot River. Here's the county road crossing the, the built up across the floodplain. And here is this funny little thing right here going across this um, terrace surface. It doesn't seem to affect the modern floodplain, but there's definitely, um, uh, this, this is known as a fault scarp. And this is the record of a prehistoric earthquake that was big enough to rupture up to and offset the surface of the ground. Um, we think we understand that earthquakes smaller than about magnitude six and a half in this part of the world are too small to cause these surface ruptures. So whenever you see a, a, a fault scarp at the surface, you're looking at the record of a magnitude six and a half or seven earthquake that occurred in prehistory. Well, with the digital elevation model, you can, you can draw a topographic profile. So, uh, Starting at this end, here's elevation in feet, um, and this surface is sloping down to the right. Where it crosses the fault scarp, you see this drop, and then it continues on at a similar angle below that. And if you measure the elevation difference between this upper surface and this lower surface, it's on the order of four to five feet, which is a reasonable amount for a big prehistoric earthquake. So. Um, uh, the age of this surface that is offset, we, we do not yet know. Um, we believe that there's a there's mountain glaciers were right above here, and when they melted out 12,000 years ago, they sent a flood of water and sediment down this valley that spread out and probably formed these big outwash surfaces. So we know that the earthquake that offsets that surface has to be younger than that and older than the last flood on the, on the uh, floodplain. If we go down to uh, the area south of Hamilton, Ward Creek, here's an alluvial fan at the mouth of the, of the mountain front. It's just off the edge of this image. And it's a complex uh, alluvial fan system. An alluvial fan is just where a, a mountain stream comes down, hits flatter ground, dumps all its sediment uh, out, usually in a fan shape, uh, at the toe of the mountain front. And here, this, is, this fan has been incised by several Young, younger stream channels. Uh, there's one fairly young channel kind of on top of the surface of the fan here. And this thing going right across here is the trace of the Bitterroot Fault. And we wrote topographic profiles on this older, higher stranded surface and on the youngest surface. And here we see an offset of about seven vertical feet. And up here, it's about 40 feet. Here's a view of that fault on that, that northern part. Um, we're looking along the fault scarp. Up on top of this ridge here, it's actually a, a smooth slope going back up for some distance towards the mountain front. And this surface down here, before that 40-foot displacement, used to be would match up with that surface up there. So here is geologic evidence for some 
I don't know, maybe maybe five or six prehistoric earthquakes that have occurred along this fault uh, since however old this, this uh, alluvial pan surface is. And then jumping down to the south end of the valley, um, this is uh, Como Lake uh, up uh, south of Hamilton. And uh, the LIDAR data shows very nicely these ridge, ridge features, which are actually old um, glacial lateral moraines that came out of Rock Creek during previous ice ages. This oldest, uh, out, outermost um, ridge, we presume is the oldest. We don't have dates on any of these things yet. Uh, there's a big ridge here. And then much below that inset are these is this younger um, glacial deposits that look much fresher. They're more rumply. You can see individual ridges in there. These are older and smoother, weathered, more gully, suggesting they've been out weathering for a much longer time than these inner surfaces. But here is the fault coming across both these ridge crests and then going down into the younger, the younger uh, glacial deposits there. So we drew a series of uh, topographic profiles along the crests of various ridge features here. Um, I'll just mention that, that Shannon Gulch is a little drainage that's trapped between the youngest glacial deposits and this older ridge. It comes down here, it's offset by the fault, and there's a little lake here where, where, the, where the glacial sediments kind of uh, impounded or dammed up the, the, the drainage there. So we drew topographic profiles along, starting from <coughs> south to north, this, this oldest, highest thing. There's over 200 feet of offset on that one. Um, maybe something like 60 on that intermediate ridge, although there's something funny going on. We don't understand yet. The, the uh, anaphetic fault has got almost as much offset as the main ridge. And then down in this Shannon Creek, there's about 13 feet of um, offset in younger, in much younger materials. So here's a view looking south at that highest, oldest ridge. I've put in a dotted line there to approximate where the land surface is uh, in the timber. But this offset here, from up here down to here, is that 230 feet. And then looking in, uh, focusing in on these um, smaller features down here. Um, first I'll show, well, I'll just show these in successive orders from, from south to north. So here's the, the southernmost one. There's something like 40 feet, 22 feet on the next uh, moraine crest. The last place we see it, it's more like six feet. And then the, lat, the ridge below that has no offset. And so here's a couple of pictures, what this looked like. You know, here's that 40 foot offset. I'm standing up here looking down to the ridge below that. There's a forest road in the, in the background there. In this, uh, looking down the 20-foot uh, offset, you can see that moraine ridge running along here. And this would be the amount of offset. Here it is in profile. There's the upper side, all just somewhere in this little saddle. And here's the lower side. And then down to the lowest one, the 6-foot one, I'm standing on the ridge looking back up it. Uh, from somewhere in the vicinity of the stump up to about that boulder is the 6th is the vertical foot offset. And you can just see the edge of the road there uh, in this view. The next picture would be just to the right of that. There's the same road. And here this moraine crest is, is un, unfaulted. So what we're seeing is evidence for multiple, the, the older the, the, the land form, the more it's been offset by that fault, indicating that there have been repeated earthquakes along this along this fault through geologic time. So it's, um, even though we don't have any earthquakes there today, it looks like it probably is an important fault. Um, important for one reason I forgot to point out, and that is um, if you follow where this fault goes, it's pointing, there's Como Dam right there. And we think this is probably the fault in the ridge north of the dam. So somewhere the fault has to get from there to there. Um, if it doesn't go under the dam, it's pretty darn close. So a big earthquake on that fault might be a, might be a deal, not a big deal. So 
Th this is a map showing the change in county population since the last major earthquake in Montana, the 1959 Hibgen Lake earthquake, and the last census available, which was 2010. Blue counties have lost population. <coughs> Yellow, red counties have gained population. And I think you've got to conclude that uh, people want to live where there are earthquakes. <laughs> <laughs> Butte is, uh, let's see, oh, Butte is right here. Right here. So we're just on the edge of the, um, when you get over the hill of Whitehall, you're getting into the inner mountain side. And then just one last final curiosity. Um, we may have seen in the paper recently on March 14th there was a propane explosion in Helena. Somebody was injured. But uh, we have a seismic station up in that corner of the valley. And this blip right here, um, blown up up here, is the recording of that propane explosion. And we know that it was um, that, that the signal that we recorded was actually traveling through the air rather than through the earth. Huh. Um, these little vertical tick marks on the top trace are four seconds apart. And you can see as the main sound wave got there, the amplitude of ground motion increased. Well, the sound wave travels much slower in the atmosphere than the seismic waves travel through the earth. And so as that sound wave is sweeping across the landscape, getting closer to the seismic station, it's putting energy into the ground, which races out ahead of it, arriving at the station before the sound wave. And then the sound wave arrives, and then the same thing happens in reverse. As the, as the sound wave disappears off into the distance, it's sending seismic energy back towards the seismic station. So this is the classic signal of a, of a sonic boom or a, a sound wave recording at a seismic huh. station. So that's everything I've got, and I'm more than happy to try and take any questions you might have.